Coming up on Science News Weekly, we've got giant lasers, a lot of hot air, and a peak at holes. That's up next on Science News Weekly. Netcasts you love from people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Science News Weekly with Dr. Kiki, Episode 5, recorded Thursday, March 22nd, 2012. My hair smells like dinosaurs. Today is March 22nd, 2012, and the, these are the science headlines that made news this week. The world's first two megajoule ultraviolet laser was fired at the National Ignition Facility, or NIF, in Livermore, California. If you've watched Twit's Green Tech Today series, you'll be aware from the tour that we filmed that the facility's target for laser ignition of the Golden Hole Room was 1.8 megajoules, and the laser is really made up of 192 lasers aimed carefully at the center of a spherical chamber with the goal of creating nuclear fusion. NIF hopes to achieve ignition before the end of the fiscal year, so we don't have long to wait for some real results. Tell you, I'm excited about that. Results of observations by NASA's Messenger spacecraft were reported in Science this week, and planetary scientists are scratching their heads. Data suggests that Mercury was tectonically active until at least 2 billion years ago and has a solid shell surrounding its molten core that isn't present in any other planet in our solar system. The U.S. Geological Survey and NASA released the first geological map of EO, Jupiter's highly volcanic moon. The map was assembled using images taken by NASA's Voyager mission and the Galileo orbiter. 8,000 years of human history in Syria have been unearthed from space by MIT and Harvard researchers. The study published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences used satellites to image the reflectivity of the soil, which changes based on the presence of compounds called anthrosols that are left behind by decayed human wastes. The method allowed the team to track human movements, pinpoint major settlements, and even suggests that water isn't necessary for settlements to form. Ken Caldera and Nathan Mervold report in the journal Environmental Research Letters that natural gas, while a fine source of energy, is not the bridge between coal-based electricity generation and low greenhouse gas emission energy that the U.S. government suggests it is. Rather, emphasis should be placed on new technologies incorporating conservation, solar, wind, nuclear, and possibly carbon capture and storage. However, Richard York writes in Nature Climate Change that over the past 50 years, renewable Renewable resources of energy have barely kept up with increasing energy demands of the world. The results of this study suggest that to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels, we will either need to reduce our energy demands or expand the adoption of alternative energy sources. Canadian oil sands are supposed to be one of the largest sources for oil on the planet, but extracting the oil from the sand is costly. A new study in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences hints that it might be even more costly than previously thought. Carbon sequestration potential of the mining sites will be drastically diminished due to the loss of existing peaty wetlands as a result of mining operations and diminished ability of the post-mining lands to sequester carbon. The paper estimates that between 11 and 48 million tons of carbon that is currently fixed into the peat will be freed. And Ars Technica equates this to seven years of emissions from the mining operations. Is that like seven years of bad luck for breaking a mirror? Anyway, a study in the journal Psychological Science finds that perception is everything when it comes to golf. By changing the perceived size of a golf hole to make it appear smaller or larger, they changed the performance of golfers accordingly. The Tennessee Senate passed a bill that protects teachers from being punished for, quote, helping students to understand, analyze, critique, and review in an objective manner the scientific strengths and weaknesses of existing scientific theories. The American Association for the Advancement of Science, National Center for Science Education, and the American Civil Liberties Union opposed the bill, saying it is an indirect way to allow the teaching of creationism or intelligent design in the classroom. 
Trees do more than create oxygen for us to breathe. According to a paper out of Queensland University of Technology, they also act as pumps for radon, releasing it into the air through transpiration. The scientists estimate that as much as 37% of radon ions in a eucalyptus forest might come from the trees, and those ions might be involved in atmospheric electrification. Kind of interesting there. If you have ever experienced altitude sickness, you know how uncomfortable it can make you feel. And to some, it can even be deadly. Recent research shows that ibuprofen taken before ascending to altitude is successful in reducing severity of altitude sickness symptoms. In the study, it reduced incidence of illness by 26%. If you never got a chance to fly on the supersonic Concorde jet before it was retired, in part as a result of too many complaints about the noise of the sonic boom heard by people on the ground, you may yet get a chance to go supersonic. Researchers at MIT have developed a model of a modified biplane. That's right, a plane with two wings on each side that would produce less drag at supersonic speeds than conventional conventional designs and that would produce less of a boom. We just have to wait and see if the model can fly. And that does it for the science headlines this week. Let me know what you think about these science news stories or tell me what you think should be news by emailing drkiki at drkiki.tv and, uh, leave, or leave me a voicemail, voicemail, not a voice meal. That would be hard to chew. 650-741-5454. I appreciate your input. To watch the full episode of Dr. Kiki Science Hour, head over to twit.tv slash kiki. Thanks for watching.